holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, 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 awesome, awesome, awesome. Mighty, mighty, mighty. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Strong, strong, strong. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You deserve all of our praise, Lord. All of our hearts, all of our, our adoration is yours and yours alone. This is a room full of worshipers in spirit and in truth. And Lord, tonight is yours. Our hearts are yours. Our love is yours. Our actions yours. Our pain, our roads ahead are yours. Our plans for our future are yours. This city is yours. Our relationships are yours. Our marriages are yours. Our children are yours. We lay it all before you as an offering to you, our King, the one who laid down his life. It's yours, it's yours, it's yours. Our praise is yours and yours alone. Lord, we love you. Thank you for meeting with us in this space, this space where heaven meets earth, this place of worship. Father, I pray that you would speak to us tonight, that hearts would be soft, ready to receive your word. Lord, we love you, and Lord, we look to you. Have your way tonight in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. How we doing, church? Anybody happy to be, oh, my voice, anybody happy to be at church on a Sunday night? Heartbeat Sunday, round two. It's going to be a good night. Why don't you go ahead and take a moment, greet somebody around you, find your seats, all of you guys. I love it that you're up front. I love it. Go ahead and grab your seat. Grab your seat and get your Bible, okay? Grab your seat and get your Bible, thank you. Hey, thanks for coming out for Heartbeat Sunday, Heart and Soul Part Two. There's not a room I love more to minister in than a room full of people like this, who have put their hands up and said, hey, I am heart and soul into what God is building the kingdom of God, the church of Jesus Christ, not just our church, but around the world, who not are just believers, but are disciples, right? There's a difference, right? And uh, it's a joy to minister to people who say, hey, here I am, Lord, use me. Every part of me is yours. I'm putting it on offer for you to do like you please. And uh, we're gonna pick up on what Eric shared this morning, which I thought was just a brilliant message. Eric, can we put our hands together for our pastor, he talked about the compassion of Christ, right? That compassion actually moves us into action. And at the end of his message, he talked about, we prayed, we prayed for people. We prayed, here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord, send me. And um, I've, I've had moments like that, many moments like that growing up through my life and my journey with Jesus at an altar call at a moment of worship where with my mouth, I say, Lord, here I am, send me. But then maybe my, my, my life, my heart doesn't follow up to the words that I say. So this is a part two, okay, are you ready? We prayed, here I am, Lord, send me. But how many of you know that in order to be sent successfully, you have to be prepared? That we can't just say with our lips, here I am, send me, but we actually have to prepare with our hearts to be sent well. So we're gonna talk about what it looks like to be sent well how to prepare to be used by God, how to prepare our hearts, the soil within to be used by God. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Our main passages of scripture, they're found in 2 Timothy, okay? So open your Bible to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter two. And uh, we're gonna read two different portions of that chapter. The apostle Paul, he's writing to Timothy. He's a son in the faith. And Timothy was a pastor in the city of Ephesus. And uh, Ephesus, was bringing a lot of opposition to the believers in that time, opposition to the message of Jesus. And Paul, he was writing to Timothy to encourage him, to challenge him, to strengthen him. And he said, hey, Timothy, I'm gonna write these things to you, but I want you to then go and tell the church about it. All right, so I'm writing to you and I want you to then go and encourage exactly what I'm saying to you. I want you to bring to the believers, the followers of Jesus in Ephesus. And he, he writes this in 2 Timothy 2, verse two through seven. You then, Timothy, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people, 
who will also be qualified to teach others, right? Sh share it, share it, share it, and trust him. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Everybody say soldier. I want you to underline that. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also if anyone competes in athletics, everybody say athletics, underline that. He is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer, everybody say farmer, must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, Timothy, and may the Lord give you understanding in all of these things. And then Paul goes on to remind Timothy that even though Paul was chained in prison, that the word of God could never be chained and that it would still go forth and that if we actually die with Jesus, we will also live and reign with Jesus. And Paul says, hey, I want you to remind the people of these things. Paul says, Timothy, I'm going to remind you. And Timothy, I want you to remind the church in Ephesus of these things that I'm going to write about. So tonight, God has reminded me of some things and I am going to remind us. They're not new, but I'm going to remind us afresh of some things that we need to be aware of, we need to be thinking about, we need to be leaning into. In 2 Timothy 2, 15 through 25, Paul picks it up. He says, hey, Timothy, make every effort to present yourself approved, of, approved to God, an unashamed workman who accurately handles the word of truth, the Bible. But avoid irreverent empty chatter, which will only lead to more ungodliness, and the talk of such men will spread like gangrene. Love that word. Among them are Hymenus and Philetus who have deviated from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already occurred and they undermine the faith of some. Or has already occurred, they undermine the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord must turn away from iniquity. A large house contains not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some indeed are for honorable use, but others are for common use. So if anyone cleanses himself of what is unfit, he will be a vessel for honor. Everybody say vessel for honor. Sanctified. We love that word. Useful to the master and prepared for every good work. I want you to flee. Everybody say flee from youthful passions and pursue, say pursue, righteousness, faith, love, and peace together with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, but reject or avoid, say avoid foolish and ignorant speculation, for you know that it breeds quarreling. And a servant of the Lord must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach and forbearing. He must gently reprove those who oppose him in the hope that God may grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. What a passage of scripture. Tonight when I want to preach a message that I'm calling Holy Vessels. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you, and we sit here tonight wanting to be used by you. We said, here we are, Lord, send us, send us to our city, send us to our neighborhood, send us to our co-workers, send us to our family members, send us to our friends, wherever you want to take us, send us. So Holy Spirit, right now, I pray that you would prepare us to be sent. Prepare hearts that can be useful to the master, vessels, honorable vessels, holy vessels, ready to do your will whenever you need it done in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Hunter. Thank you for that. Um, you know, my Nana, she passed away recently, actually just about a month ago. And she passed away, and she was a fantastic Nana. I loved her. She lived about three hours away up north on a lake. And um, she, she it was one of those people where when she got into something, she got really into something. It's kind of like my husband, okay? Like if, if Eric gets a new hobby, everybody knows. You don't need him to tell you. You can see it. I've witnessed it, right? Like it's out there. Mm. And my Nana, she, uh, she, 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 she didn't have much in life, and her husband left her. He was an alcoholic, and they, were very, they, they didn't have any money. And then she eventually married somebody who was wonderful, and he also was rich. So that really helped. And um, so my Nana had some, some resources for her new hobbies, am I right? And so uh, she, she got into, okay, I'm curious to see if anybody in here is in, was into this or had moms or um, grandparents who were. She got into collecting porcelain dolls. Does anybody have anybody that's a collector? Okay, I see some hands up there. God sees your hand. So she started collecting porcelain dolls, and looking back later in life, it was truly creepy. But in the moment, I was so obsessed with those porcelain dolls. I mean, they were everywhere. You walked into her home, every room, there were just porcelain dolls. Like every time she would travel somewhere, she would collect a porcelain doll, and she would also collect china. 
All right, so she was collecting some stuff. She'd go to Alaska, Alaskan porcelain doll, Alaskan china, okay? And so I'd go up to my Nana's house, and all I wanted to do as a little girl was to play with these dolls. Like, I would sit there, and I would stare at them, and I'm like, Nana, please just let me play with these dolls. And she's like, no, you cannot play. You can only look. And I'm just desperate as a little girl to, to play with these dolls, but I never could. And uh, a few weeks before my Nana passed, I was up there with her and my mom. And she looked at me and she said, hey, Alexa, she said, honey, I want you to bring Olive up. And I want you to tell Olive that she can have any porcelain doll that she wants. And I want you to tell her that she should play with them because they're not meant to be looked at. I, I wish I would have let you play with them. But I just, I just was, too, I was too anxious. But you should tell Olive that she can use these dolls. She can play with them. And, and honey, I want to give you my china. And I want to encourage you, don't just put it somewhere to be displayed. I, I want you to use it. These dolls, they, they were meant to be used. This, this china, it was meant to be eaten off of. And, and I think it, it reminds us of this passage of scripture that we read because you and I, we were created to be a holy vessel. We are made to be used by God to reach our world. And here's what I love about vessels is that for a vessel, it doesn't matter what the outside looks like. All that matters about a vessel is what it's carrying, what it's carrying. And we're instruments for God's power and for his love and his kindness and his redemption. And, and here's what I love about the Holy Spirit is I believe that he is very good at his job. The Holy Spirit, can we agree, is very good at his job. So he, he's the one who can convict us. He's the one who can change us. He's the one who can draw people to Jesus. And his job is to be good at his job. And our job is just to, to simply show up as a vessel, as a vessel. But we got to get good at our job at showing up, right? He's good at his job. We got to grow up being good at our job as showing up as a vessel. And hear me, I'm so grateful that God is our father, and I am so thankful that Jesus is our friend. But at the end of the day, this is the beautiful thing about living in the layers of the kingdom of God. Yes, God is our father and Jesus is our friend. But at the end of the day, he is almighty God and we are here to serve him. We're servants. When we, when we get to heaven one day, what do we want to hear? Well done, my good and faithful servant. We've been talking a lot in church about how Jesus is our Lord, right? This group knows that. He's our Lord. He's, he's not just somebody we follow or we believe in. No, no, he's our Lord. Tonight, I want to take us up another step in that direction, and I want to remind us that Jesus is our master. He's our master. He's our master. 2 Timothy 20 through 21 Remind us of what we read. A large house contains not only vessels of silver and gold, talking about the house of God, talking about the church of Jesus Christ, but also of wood and clay. Some indeed are for honorable use, but others are for common use. So if anyone cleanses himself of what is unfit, he will be a vessel for honor, a holy vessel, sanctified, useful to the master, and prepared for every good work. The apostle Paul, he was contrasting two different type of vessels. Honorable vessels and dishonorable vessels. Honorable vessels of silver and gold and dishonorable vessels like maybe a trash can or an ashtray or paper plates. What Paul is not saying here is, hey, let's become honorable vessels and just be used slightly for special occasions and sit on the shelf. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, hey, God has special plans and purposes that he wants to outwork on the earth. And he is looking for a vessel who has been set aside, who has been sanctified, who has done the work. Say, hey, master, I want you to use me, who has cleansed himself. Come on, we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. He cleanses us. But did you catch this? It says, who cleanses himself, cleanses himself to be used, to be, to be fit for the master. For the master. Listen to this closely. Salvation is a gift we receive. Discipleship is a journey we surrender to. But the mission of God is something we actively participate in. The mission of God. The mission of God. God wants to move. He's looking for a vessel. And tonight I want to remind us of what the Lord has reminded me, that you are that vessel. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. God wants to use the saints more than he wants to use the stage. 
We gather on Sundays to be equipped, to be taught, to, be, to grow spiritually, to deepen our roots, right? But then we scatter out into our world to do the work of the ministry, to do the work of the ministry. We gather and we scatter. We gather and we scatter. You're the vessel. Hear me, in your world, you're the vessel. You are the minister. You're the minister. Say, I'm the same. I'm a vessel. And I've got work to do. You've got work to do. Ephesians 2.10 tells us, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. God has good works for you to do. They are not just an afterthought. They've been prepared long in advance. He knows every single day of your life, the amount of hairs on your head, has a calling for you, a plan, a purpose, a destiny for you. Like specifically you. All of us, yes, collectively, individually, for you, for your life. There are good works for you to do. And if we don't do it, I think God will still get it done. I just believe he'll use a vessel who's ready. I believe he'll use a vessel who's ready, but I want that vessel to be us. I think we can be that church full of vessels ready for the master, for anything he wants to do. He has plans for you, for me, for our church. And he's looking for us to partner with him, to co-labor with him. And I think sometimes when we think about being a vessel, we can just think a narrow thought of just being somebody to share the gospel. Right? We just think, okay, I have to be a vessel to share the gospel to get somebody saved. And I think that's important. We talked about that this morning. But I want to create, maybe paint just a grander view of what it looks like for us to be vessels. Because there's a lot of ways that we can be a vessel for the kingdom of God. Yes, it is sharing the gospel. But I think for us, it looks like using our lives to push back the darkness in whatever sphere we're in. It looks like shining the light of Jesus in our school systems. Come on, are there any public school teachers here? I believe you are a modern day missionary. You are pushing back the darkness to kids in their lives. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know how God will use you. You don't know how people will look back and say, hey, that teacher loved me, showed me truth, had a scripture on their desk. You might not be able to say the name of Jesus, but you can show them. You're pushing back the darkness. Or maybe you're in the sphere of government. You need to push back the darkness. Maybe you, you're in, at, in the home. Come on, the home is so important. You're raising little kids. You're building up disciples to change the world. You're pushing back the darkness as you're raising that family, right? It can look like loving the poor and the widow and the foreigner. It can look like praying for the brokenhearted and bounding up their, binding up their wounds. It can look like a million kingdom things. But at the end of it all, it simply looks like a life laid down for Christ. A life laid down. A life laid down. He's looking for vessels he can trust, like he wrote to Paul in 2 Timothy, vessels who know how to rightly divide the word of truth. Vessels who know how to tame the tongue, which James talks about is nearly impossible. Vessels who know how to talk gently with those who don't believe in Jesus. Vessels who know how to teach, how to pray. He's looking for vessels that have set themselves apart to be used by the master. Come on, I don't know about you, church, but I want to be an honorable vessel. When God looks down from heaven and says, hey, I, need, I have a good work I need to be done in Kalamazoo Mission. I, I know who can do it. I've got a daughter there. Her name's Alexa. She is a trustworthy vessel. I can depend on her. I can count on her. Come on, I think we're to be the church. That when God looks down from I want to move in Kalamazoo. We're the vessels he can use. We've done the work. We're ready. Ready to pour it all out. Not going to be dishonorable, but going to be honorable vessels. Ready to serve the master, the master. I think we have to do a few things. It looks like, we we read it, it looks like fleeing some things. It looks like avoiding some things. And it looks like pursuing some things. Say flee, avoid, pursue. We're we're, we're to flee youthful passions, Paul says. To flee thinking life is just about us. To flee these passions for sin or, or for ourselves or for fit. We're to flee actually that. To leave behind youthful passions. We're to flee that. We're to avoid gossip and chatter that doesn't build up and edify the body. We're to flee. We're to avoid. And we're to pursue righteousness, love, faith, and peace with all believers. And as we pursue those things, as we flee those things, avoid those things, and pursue those things, we start to become vessels ready for the master. But here's the tension. How, how do we do that? 
How do we become holy vessels? How do we grow to be useful to the master? How do we become ready and prepared for every good work? How do we live with laid down lives? Because that's not natural. It's not like you wake up one day and you're like, I'm just here to lay my life down today. I just want to lay it down for anybody and everybody. No, that's not natural. That, 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 that's unnatural. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit helps us to learn to live laid down lives. And we're going to bring it full circle here because I think the passage of Scripture that we read in 2 Timothy 2 tells us tonight that, 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 that how do we do that? Well, I like to suggest that we do so by learning to become vessels like soldiers, like athletes, and like farmers. Soldiers, athletes, and farmers. What do all three of these have in common? Well, the soldier laid down their life for their country. The athlete lays down their life for the competition. And the farmer lays down their life for the crop. All three of these vocations require perseverance and can't be done by living with passivity. As we grow in our Christian life to be like a soldier, like an athlete, like a farmer, we will grow in preparation to be a useful vessel for God, our master, ready for any good work. So first, you're like a soldier. Tonight, you're a soldier. I don't care if you're in the marketplace, if you're a pastor, if you're a preacher, if you're a mom, if you're a dad, if you stay home. Here we are. We all are together as the body of believers. We're like soldiers, all right? My brother-in-law, he spent some time in the Navy, and uh, he was in submarines. And I remember because uh, my sister, her, their kids were really little. And every time that he would be deployed for months at a time, they would come home, and they would live with our family to get extra support. And so my brother-in-law, he would go away for six to eight months at a time. And um, it, that's a big sacrifice. How many of you know? If, if we've got any military families that have served, we honor you. That's a big sacrifice. And, um, and they'd be separated for months at a time, and the only way they could communicate, because he was underwater, was by, like, letters every four months, sometimes a phone call if they were lucky. He wouldn't sleep for days at a time. Um, he wouldn't see his family. He had to miss some of his boys growing up. And he, he made all of this sacrifice, all to protect a country that he loved, and it was honorable. How many of you know that that's honorable? Oftentimes the most honorable things in life are the things that require the most sacrifice. The most sacrifice. In 2 Timothy, Paul's writing to Timothy. He's trying to encourage him in the face of this opposition of the gospel. And, and some people have decided to oppose the gospel and say that Jesus had never resurrected. And Timothy was wondering, how do we endure, Paul? How do we persevere in the face of this challenge? We didn't see it coming. How do we be honorable vessels that the master can use even in, in this that we didn't see coming in this opposition? And let me remind you of, of what Paul says. He says, you therefore must endure endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as, an office, as a soldier. And also, if anybody competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake in the crops. Consider what I say, Timothy, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. I think Paul is being intentional with his words here. If we want to be a holy vessel ready for the master to use, then we have to learn what it means to be a soldier for Jesus. We have to learn how to endure hardship and opposition to the way of Christ and to grow in our sacrifice and our surrender. He could have said, hey, Paul, endure hardship like a good worker, like a good leader, like a good parent, like a good artist. He could have said a lot of things of how we're to endure. But he, didn't. he said, hey, hey, Timothy, I want you to endure hardship like a good soldier. I use the word like in these points because Paul's using imagery to help us understand different realities of the Christian life. Of course, we're not literally soldiers. That's how cults form. Okay? We're not literally soldiers, but we're called to fight the good fight of faith. We have spiritual armor that we're meant to put on, like we know in Ephesians 6. We have an enemy who is real, but the good news is that we have the victory in a king named Jesus Christ, and we're to enforce his victory. While we're here on earth as soldiers of Jesus, our fight is not against flesh and blood. We know this, church. It's not against people. We're not picking up sword or stone. Ephesians 6 12 says, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. You see, when my brother-in-law was a submarine, he wasn't consumed with the day-to-day -day drama of what was unfolding. He actually didn't know much about what was going on. Uh, he wasn't in civilian clothing. He was in his dress blues. He wasn't obsessed with celebrity culture. He was trying to protect people. He wasn't scrolling social media endlessly. He was trying to stop global issues. He wasn't gossiping into drama or divisive situations. Why? Because he had someone supervising him. 
And his supervisor wasn't going to be pleased with that. He was on duty. He had a mission. People were depending on him. It reminds me of Paul just imploring Timothy, hey, Timothy, I know that you're enduring hardship. I know that culture has really changed. I know that the past 10 years have done things that you didn't see coming. But, but here, listen, I, I'm not just going to level with you and say I'm so sorry that this has been so hard. No, no, Timothy, what he, here's what you need to do, Timothy. Endure hardship. Like a soldier, you're going to have to get a little bit gritty. You're going to have to learn what it means to stand, to stand in this fight of faith. You're going to have to be like a soldier. And why are you going to have to be like a soldier? You're actually going to have to not be concerned with civilian affairs. Because you're, you're not a civilian right now. Right now you're on duty. And what you need to do, you need to live your life to please your supervisor. Because he's the one who got you in here in the first place. No one is engaged in warfare and tangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now listen, this is a little bit for a different message, but the great thing about being in the army, being a soldier, is there are times when you're on duty, and there are times when you're resting. But in season or out, if you're needed, you are ready to go. You are ready to go. And I think Paul was saying to Timothy, hey, Timothy, I don't want you to worry about the chatter of other people. I don't want you to worry about those who have walked away from the faith. I don't want you to worry about those who are spreading lies about Jesus. Don't worry about the cares of this world. Set your mind on things that are far above, not just above, but are far above. And learn to please God, who is your commanding officer, who enlisted you in the first place. You need to get back to your post, Timothy. You need to get back to your post. You need to get back on mission. I need you to put your armor back on. You're my vessel. I want to use you. I need you focused. I need you sharp. I need you right here with me. Jesus Christ is the commander of all of heaven's armies. In Joshua 5, Jesus appeared to Joshua as the commander of the army of the Lord. Hear me, church. Jesus is our commanding officer. And we owe him our obedience and our allegiance. Our obedience and our allegiance. It's likely that Paul was actually chained to one of these soldiers while he was in prison, while he was writing this letter. And he saw how these soldiers acted. He saw how they obeyed their commanding officer, how they were strong, not lazy. How when they were on duty, they were always alert. They were never sleeping. Paul knew that this is how a Christian must act towards their Lord. Lord, wherever you send me, I'll go. Whatever you tell me to do, I'll do. Wherever you lead me, I'll follow. Like a good soldier, I'm not going to be caught up in what's going on around me. The useless chatter, the crazy narratives of what's on the news or the enemy's narratives, the drama unfolding around me, who's who on social media, followers, or who's not following me. I'm not going to let the Pope dissuade me that Jesus is not the only way back to God. Here's where I'm going to focus. I'm going to get back to my post. People are depending on us. People are depending on us, and so often we can walk through life asleep. We're spiritually asleep. Me too, I've been there. And then God wakes us up, and he says, hey, it's time to get right back to your post. You're my soldier. I'm your commanding officer. I'm your father. I'm your friend. But I'm your master. And I'm, I need my church alive. I need my church awake. It's not time to be sleeping. It's time to get up, get back to our post. We got a city waiting for us. You have people in your world waiting for you, depending on you, to be awake, to be ready, to be a good soldier, to endure hardship, to endure, to have grit, to be strong in the grace of God. People are waiting for you. If you're, we, got, we, got to, we got to flee complacency. We have to flee laziness, lack of participation in the kingdom of God. We actually have to pursue, pursue resilience in the face of hardship, in the face of culture, opposing the way of Jesus, we have to pursue resilience. If you're going to be a holy vessel, you have to be like a soldier. Second, you have to be like an athlete. Now, I'm not much of an athlete. Um, I played travel soccer when I was growing up, and I barely made the team every single year. Like, I truly think my coach just felt bad for me. Like, he, he's kind of like, oh, should Alexa make it this year or not? Well, all her friends are on the team, so I don't need to play her. I can just have her be at the practices. Like, she's fine. But I married into a really competitive family, okay? And so I'll have moments of competition, but really, it's just, it's just like, not in my nature. 
I shared this at a Valley Girls message that when I was younger, um, before I was a soldier for Christ, okay, I didn't know how to pray yet. I, I was on my way to soccer games, and I would pray that God would help us to get in a car accident that nobody got hurt in so that I wouldn't have to actually go out and play the game. Like, why was I still on the team? Why was I still playing? Why didn't I have the courage to tell my parents, I don't want to do this. Somebody needs to help me. Like, that, that was just me. I was not, I'm not an athlete. I'm still not. Never was, never will be. <laughs> but so sometimes when I see in the Bible our faith being likened to being like an athlete, I can just count myself out. But Paul often wrote in the New Testament about the world of athletics for illustrations for the Christian life. He mentioned track and field in 1 Corinthians 9.24, boxing in 1 Corinthians 9.26, and wrestling in Ephesians 6.12, running, boxing, and wrestling. All my favorite sports and pastimes. Thank you, Paul. You couldn't have drawn inspiration from thrifting or from antiquing or from coffee shops or from journaling. Like, we're, like help me, help it, help it make sense for me. Or scrolling on social media. Couldn't you have drawn something from that? All my favorite hobbies. If we're to be holy, honorable vessels ready for the master to use at any time for any good work, we're going to have to learn to be like a good athlete in our walk with God, disciplined, intentional, committed committed. 2 Timothy 2, 5 reads, and also if anyone competes in athletics, I want us to hear this, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. According to the rules. The point here is clear. An athlete can't make up the rules as he pleases. He must compete according to the rules if he wants to receive the crown, otherwise he will be disqualified. Do you guys remember when um, those Livestrong yellow bracelets were, like, all the rage? I think I was in middle school. It was, it was Lance Armstrong's, like, like uh, I think it was his association raising money for cancer. I remember my dad, he came home from a work trip, and he brought me one of these yellow Livestrong bands, okay? And I wore that thing. I mean, it was my statement jewelry piece of choice all throughout middle school. I wore that thing, and, and, and I just loved it. And he also brought me back, which I was laughing about. I remembered today. He brought me back a picture of Lance Armstrong on his, on his bicycle, and I put it in my room. It was like a pink, blue, green, and orange room with just, like, lamps sitting there on the side. Uh, I don't know what type of work trip he was at, but um, here's the thing. We know this about Lance, right? Lance Armstrong, he was one of the most famous cyclists of our day. He was winning race after race after race, competition after competition after competition. He was crowned so many victories, but then in 2012, he was stripped of his titles after an investigation revealed that he had been using steroids during the years which would, in which he won those titles. Here at this church, it is possible to fall into the mistake of thinking that we can make up our own rules or ways for our Christian life. What Paul is saying here is that when we follow Jesus but don't live our lives submitted to Scripture, it's like people trying to be athletes that don't compete according to the rules, and it's all for naught. It's all for naught. For some people, this sounds like, you know, I know this is sin, but God understands, so I'm just going to keep, keep doing this. Or I know the Bible teaches this about forgiveness, but I'd rather hold on to, to my anger, to my grudge. Or I know the Bible teaches this about marriage, but I think I, I know more, I know better, and so I'm going to just, I'm going to take, I'm going to believe what I want to believe about that. Or teaches this about our sexuality, I think I know I'm going to do differently. So I, I like the Bible, but I'm not submitted to it. Or it teaches this about honor, but I don't think that they deserve honor. So I like the Bible, but I'm not submitted to it. And I'm not following the rules of the game that I am competing in like an athlete, like an athlete. This goes against the attitude of an athlete who must compete according to the rules. Scripture gives us commands and boundaries for beauty, may I add, that lead us into beauty as followers of Jesus that ultimately bring us to freedom. But where the world says anything goes, that just leads us to bondage. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 reminds us all of Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training us in righteousness, which is what we're meant to pursue. So that the servant of God, that's you, serving the master, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work that you're called to go out into the world and do, right, as the saint. John 8, 31 through 32 says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 2 Timothy 2, 15, we read it earlier. Do your best to present yourself to God as an approved, as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, 
rightly handling the word of truth. Listen, church, there's a spiritual fight for the authority and truth of the Bible right now. Can you feel that? Speaking of AI, an Israeli historian said AI can create its own ideas. The Gutenberg printing press printed as many Bibles as it was ordered to, but it could not write a single new page. However, AI can do that. It can even write a new Bible. It can even write a new Bible. I want to remind us that the Bible is not made for our edits. God is not looking for our feedback. He's pretty good all on his own. What we need to do if we want to be good athletes, competing for the crown, not to be disqualified, is to submit our lives to the scripture, all of our lives, every part of it. And actually, let me encourage us, that's going to serve us. Because God gives us boundaries like we give our children for beauty, for beauty to help them, to help raise our kids to grow and be mature adults and, and live the lives that God would call them to be. And it's the same with us. It's, all of this, all of this, all of this is for your benefit. All of it, every single part of it. And if, and if you're going to veer from it, you can keep running, but it's going to be for naught. You will be disqualified. That's not how God set it up. And he's the master. We don't get to choose. We have to flee from thinking we know better than 2,000 years of church history. And we must pursue righteousness, love, peace, and truth as we say abiding in the word of God with love and truth and mercy, enduring in the face of an opposing culture, staying steady in the wake of compromise. If we want God to use us as holy vessels to continue to reach our city to a greater degree, we have to be like an athlete and commit once again, surrender once again, lay our lives down once again to the authority of God's word and his ways. If you wanna be a holy vessel, you have to be like a soldier. If you wanna be a holy vessel, you have to be like an athlete. And if you wanna be a holy vessel, you have to be like a farmer. I think it makes some logical sense that Paul wrote to Timothy encouraging him that, hey, as a follower of Jesus, you have to endure hardship, you have to be like a soldier, you have to be like an athlete. But what I did not see coming, I've gotta be honest with you in this illustration, is how he wraps it up saying, and also Timothy, I want you to be like a farmer, like a good farmer, okay? He, he says, the hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. A farmer. Unlike the soldier and the athlete, there's nothing glamorous about the work a farmer does. It is tedious, it is boring, it is unseen, and it is unexciting. It is never honored, though it is ridiculously important for our food source. The nation's best farmer really is not a celebrity unless you watch the show Farmer Wants a Wife, which I actually love and would encourage you to watch if you like reality TV. It's a fantastic show. I'm not kidding, it's really good. If we want to be holy vessels ready to be used by the master for whatever good work he has prepared for us, we must liken ourselves to a farmer. A farmer. What is God getting at here? Well, I think the point is this. We must work hard for the kingdom of God in hidden spaces and waiting places of our lives. Both the hidden spaces and the waiting places of our lives, we must be found working hard. Farmers are some of the hardest pe working people I've ever met in my life. They are up before all of us, I promise and they are doing what? They're working. And then they're working throughout the day and then they're working out into the evening. They're using both strategy and physical labor to tend to what they've planted. They plant it, they water it, and what do they do? They wait. They wait expectantly, hopefully, knowing that God is going to bring the harvest. Paul knew the value of hard work. He understood the power of hard work and also of the grace of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, 10, Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I didn't squander. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Talking about the other apostles. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. He says, hey, in comparison to all the other workers in God's harvest field, I actually worked harder than them. I, I, Paul wasn't just called, he wasn't just blessed, he wasn't just anointed. He was actually hard working and his ministry would have been far less if he wouldn't have been hard working. He was always planting churches. He was always preaching the gospel. He was always traveling. He, he was oftentimes in prison. I mean, he was working hard. When it was seen and it was unseen, he, he, was, he was planting, he was watering, he was tending, he was waiting. Sometimes we can, in our culture, expect something for nothing. But wise people know that you often get out of things the measure that you put into them. If you're putting little effort into your walk with God, you should expect little result. 
Yet at the same time, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 10, Paul knew that all the work that he did was actually nothing because he had the grace of God. It was hard work and it was the grace of God. It was hard work and it was the grace of God. It wasn't one or the other. He wasn't just laying his life down for nothing. No, no, hard work, grace of God. Here's the other thing about a farmer. Um, they should never go hungry because before they provide food for others, they always need to make sure that them and their families are eating well and taken care of. Paul said, hey, like a good farmer, if you're gonna be vessels, you also have to take part in the crop. Hey, Tim, hey Timothy, if you're gonna be a pastor, you need to make sure that you eat before you pour out. You can't, you can't give spiritual nourishment when you're empty. You need to partake in the crop. And hey, Timothy, hey, hey Timothy, tell your church this, because it's not just for pastors. If you're gonna be a vessel for God to use, they need to make sure that they are spiritually disciplined, being fed so they can pour out, because if they don't, they're gonna have a spiritual famine. They're not gonna be able to be a vessel used by God. We don't need to be in a famine of faith right now. We need to be alive. We need to be ready. We need to be full. We need to be nourished. We need this to be in us. We need to memorize this. We can't just, you, you know, like what would happen if this was taken from you? I want you to think about that. What would happen if this word of God was taken from you? How much of this scripture is embedded in our hearts? How much can we recite saying, no, no, this is not, this isn't something I read. This is my life. This is everything to me. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's in me. I'm spiritually full, I'm spiritually full. I'm not gonna put myself in a famine. I need to eat first. And I need to be a vessel for God to use. And I think the same can be applied to the truth for all of us as we go out and do the work of the ministry. You're a saint, you you got work to do. You're, you're called to the ministry. You must go out and be a vessel for God to use in our world, but you have to do it full. Can't pour out empty, have to do it full. If you look around the global landscape of the church, you can tell it's not time, hear me, it's not time for Christians to be burnt out. It's time for us to be burning bright. It's not time, it's, it's not the time for us to be burnt out in our spiritual lives. It's time for us to be burning bright. And if you're burnt out, that's okay. I just wanna encourage you, tonight is the night. Now is the time to fill back up again afresh with the word of God so you can pour back out again. It's not time to be burnt out. It's time to be burning bright. It's our responsibility. Stewarding our own souls is our responsibility. Nobody can do that for you. You have to learn to be like a farmer, to be hardworking, but also to receive the grace of God and also to never do your farming empty, empty. Because here's what I believe, I actually really believe this. Um, the world needs us to be on fire, needs us to be awake, needs us to be passionate, needs us to be working hard as ambassadors for Christ. Because spiritually speaking, I think that it's actually time for the full court press. And some of you are like, I've never heard you say so many sports analogies in one message. I never will probably do it again. But spiritually speaking, I really believe that we need to get off of the sidelines and we need to get in the game. Every single one of us, every single one of us, whether you're 10, whether you're 90, I don't care what season you're in, God has things for you to do. He has people for you to reach. You need to push back the darkness. It's a full court press. I know we might be tired, it's time to get a water break, come right back in. Like a good command, like we're gonna please our commanding officer, get back to our post. Get back to our post, all right? It's not time to be burnt out. It's time to be burning bright. I think the harvest is ripe. I, I think people are desperate for truth. I think our city needs us and is depending on us to work hard in the, for the kingdom in places that nobody sees, that isn't on stages, isn't celebrated, to be holy vessels used by God, to bring light to dark places, to plant seeds, to learn how to plant seeds well, to learn how to water them, to learn how to actually wait for God to do something, to stick around long enough in people's lives, in areas that God's placed you to stick around long enough to wait with hope and with expectation to see him move. I think we need to be in tune. We need to be awake. Um, it's a time of expansion. It's a time of stretching. It's a time to make room for those who are still to come. James 5, 7 through 8 says, be patient, church. Therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, be patient for Jesus to come back. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth being patient about it until he receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Church, we need to be like farmers. We need to work while we wait for the master to return. 
There's so much more I could say about this. I could talk about the 10 virgins who all had oil. Five of them had oil and five of them didn't. And they went and they're going to go meet the bridegroom. And, and the ones who didn't have their oil, they weren't working. They weren't ready. They, were, they weren't ready. They, they said, hey, can we borrow some of your oil? And they said, no, you can't borrow some of my oil. You need to go back and get your own oil. And so they go back. But by the time they came back, the master, the bridegroom had already come. And we could talk about that. We could talk about the parable of the 10 minas where, where, where they were supposed to do stuff with what God had given them. And then some did and some didn't. And, and the, the master came back and said, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. And hey, why didn't you do anything with what I entrusted you with? We have to work while we wait. And we have to wait expectantly. Wait expectantly. I hope Jesus comes back in my lifetime. I hope he does. I pray he does. I pray that he, Maranatha, I pray that he comes back. But if he doesn't come back in my lifetime, I'm going to spend my life working while I wait. I'm going to be a farmer. We have to flee from consumeristic Christianity and put our hands to the plow. We have to pursue working hard, co-laboring with Christ in every area of our lives. Here's what I hope we can get tonight, church. God has good works planned for you to do like you and your own life. Yes, us as a church, of course. I think that he actually has beautiful plans for us. I think he actually knows far off in advance what's gonna happen and he's readying us for the days to come. So I do believe that we have, he has good works for us as a church, but for your life, I just want you to close your eyes for a second and think, Lord, what do you have prepared for me to do? I need you to prepare me for it. I don't wanna be sent unsuccessfully. I wanna be ready for what you've prepared me for. I think the story of our city can be different if we not only say with our mouths, here I am, send me, Lord, but if we actually in our hearts prepare our hearts to be holy vessels, growing into soldiers, athletes, and farmers as we learn to lay down our lives for the cause of Christ once again. The soldier who stops fighting before the battle is finished will never see a victory. The athlete who stops running before the race is over will never win the race. The farmer who stops working before the harvest was complete will never see the fruit of his crops. We're going to sing a song. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to sing a song. It's a, uh, it's a new song. We haven't sang it before, but it's called Use Me, Lord. And um, it's really simple. I'm not going to sing it because I'm a horrible singer. I'm gifted for other things, okay? But the lyrics, they just go, you can use me, Lord. You can use me, Lord. All of my life is yours. And we want to create space tonight as the, the core of this house, is heart and soul. We're farmers, we're athletes, we're, we're soldiers. To respond once again to God, he's saying, hey, I, I am your master and I have good works for you to do. And I need you to be ready and I want to use you. And you'll be amazed by what I do in and through your life. If you would just posture yourself in the posture to say, hey, here I am, Lord, send me. Prepare me for what you've sent me to. I think sometimes in our journey of following Jesus, we need moments to re-surrender. We need moments to re-lay down our lives. We're all busy. We've all got stuff going on. There's moments like these that we need to lean into. Don't leave, the, don't leave this song unattended to in your heart. There's moments when you say, hey, Lord, here I am. I'm going to get on my knees. Use me again. Speak to me. I believe heaven wants to speak to your heart about what he has for you in the days to come, right now, right here, as you raise your family, as you're at your job, as, you're past, as you are the minister, as you are going out into all the world, God has, he wants to speak to you tonight. He wants to speak to you tonight. So we're gonna re-surrender. We're gonna relay down our lives. I think this moment is, is, is gonna be significant between you and God. I want you to use it, use it. Don't, don't just like slide by this. We're gonna go back into song of worship. We're gonna respond to God and um, I think he wants to speak to some of us. Father, we love you and we're so grateful to be yours, to be your servants. We're so thankful, Lord, that you are our father and we are so thankful, Jesus, that you are our friend. But Lord, we know that at the end of the day, we are your servants and you are our master and you have things planned for us, planned for every single person in this room long ago that you want to use them and Lord, help us to be holy vessels, sanctified, Lord, set apart, ready to be used by our master. Lord, help us to grow like soldiers, to endure hardship, that we would be a church that would endure, that would endure, that would endure, that would resist, that would have some grit in our faith, that we would be enduring like a good soldier. Lord, help us to be, to be athletes. Help us to run our race according to the rules. Father, we don't want to be disqualified. In the areas of our lives that we haven't submitted to scripture, we submit it once again. 
You can have it all. And Father, I pray to help us to be good farmers, planting seeds, any chance we get, always planting seeds, helping to water them if other people planted them, waiting expectantly for you to return, working while we wait. May we be found as a church, working, 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 doing kingdom work as we wait. You can use us, Lord. Here we are. Send us. In Jesus' name, amen.